would like to draw your attention to this uh, intro slide. It will look like this, of course, pretty much every day, something like this. The outline changes, the quotation of the day changes. Uh, but there's a new addition, the SI schedule. And that will be up there every day. And I had a student e uh, text me in web courses last night, I guess. Dr. B, what are your office hours? Well, the office hours are right there in blue. They've been up there every day since the beginning of the semester, right? As plain as, as the nose on your face. Anyway, they're right there. That's always up there. Um, so 9 o'clock to 12 noon. I had a student come in yesterday, first one of the semester. Um, also, Darian uh, is thinking about having some office hours. And of course, Shy is open for business. And this looks like a great schedule. It looks very good. Um, so let's talk about that and a few other little things. Let me just uh, encourage you to go to the SI sessions uh, with Shy as often as you can. So even if you go once a week, that's going to really help you. And the nice thing about these is uh, the Tuesday session is late enough in the day that A, a lot of you are going to be able to go to it, and B, it's going to cover the Tuesday lecture. Now, if you think about it, all the other three sessions will be able to cover Thursday and Tuesday. Thursday is going to cover Thursday, well, can cover Thursday lecture. Friday can cover everything for the week. Uh, Monday, the same. So it, it's, uh, it's going to be quite nice. And you guys are going to uh, really benefit from that. So uh, try to do that. And if you can get to that consistently, what we found uh, over the semesters is that students that do go consistently one or two times a week or more, uh, their average is a letter grade higher, about one letter grade higher uh, compared to those that don't. So, uh, so you definitely want to um, try to attend that. Now, another thing I want to mention to you is that the data from Tuesday's lecture, L5, today is L6, uh, that data, the clicking data is up. And I had a student um, text me last night. I removed the name. Matter of fact, I can't even remember who it was. I just received an email. No, I didn't send any emails out. Uh, they got a message somehow, an alert, I guess, from from web courses stating that I got zero out of four for the L5 I click questions I attended class yesterday and answered all the questions I'm confused as to why I got zero out of four is there a way in which you could change the grade now this guy is severely uh, misunderstanding the situation this is what the grades page looks like um, as of yesterday um, you know, you have homework three, homework four, and so forth. And down at the bottom, um, you're going to start seeing L5, L6, and on down to the end of the semester. And this guy's, now this is not his grade. This is my uh, demo student account. But I made it so that I had a zero and a four. So if you see L5 answers, if you see that row stating four, that means, yeah, you answered all four of the questions, okay, because there's four points possible there. And But if you didn't get any of them right, which I hate to say it, but that student didn't get any of them right, um, then that goes down as a zero. But not that you, you have an answer. So that particular student kind of misinterpreted um, the data, all right? And I don't want you to do that. Um, so remember that the, the data in the answers row, all of the answers row, so L5 answers, L6 answers, L7 answers, all the way down to uh, L30 whatever answers, uh, those are going to go into your participation grade out of 25. Now next week sometime after we get another, probably next Thursday, I'll show you exactly how those grades are calculated um, 
And remember, the the um, eighty five percent performance criterion for participation means that if you answer eighty five percent of the questions over the semester that I ask, um, you'll get twenty five out of twenty five. And I compile that data for each student uh, from the L5 answers, L6 answers, and on down to the end of the semester. Now, why do I keep track of how many you got correct? The reason I do that is so that I can give you a performance bonus at the end of the semester. Now, this one runs in the following manner. If you answer 75% of all the questions correctly, if you're here for at least 75% and you answer 75% of them correctly, you get four bonus points at, on top. Is just, so just think of that as an extra four points on your final exam. Okay? And that's the bonus. So that's, that's the bonus that you get, and that is why I keep two different tallies for each lecture. Okay, now we have a question here. Do you still have a question? Okay, uh, Rochelle. Yeah, if you get set, yeah, if you get over 75%, you get a bonus. Yeah, so if you get 75% correct or more. So in other words, if you get a B on the clicker questions for the semester. But all you have to do really is attempt them, participate with class, and you'll get 25 out of 25 if you're here for So what if if you like I had a student come up after class the other day saying, you know, I'm not I I can't make it to class Thursday. Um, you know, it, we have one or two lectures to burn. So if you have to go to the dentist, you can't, you can't change the uh, appointment or something. You've got maybe one or two lectures to burn. If so, that you're not here and you still have a good shot at getting all 85 or getting 85 percent of everything uh, answered. So, so keep that in mind. Another question. Yeah. The question is, is there any way we can see our answers? The answer to that, unfortunately, in Canvas is no. In Blackboard, are you a senior or Fred, you're a senior? Remember Blackboard? When, when I, could put it, I could put anything up in Blackboard gradebook. But the Canvas gradebook is it's really nasty. It, it doesn't let you do jack. So unfortunately, the answer to that is no. Although. Um, I mean, if you if if you think about it, you could take notes in class and write down your answers in your notes, and that and, and plus I always give you the correct answer. Well, usually, and so you can, you know, a little pencil of paper. But unfortunately, the only thing I can upload into the gradebook is a number. So like today, you're going to be typing in letters and numbers um, for your one of your questions. I can't upload that into Canvas. I could in Blackboard and so you could actually see what you know, see what you got wrong. Now, if you have a numeric answer on a midterm exam question, yeah, I can upload that. You know, like a speed, you know, 22.4 meters per second or something like that. I can upload everybody's answer, but if it's numeric if it's alphanumeric, I can't. So Okay, now, as long as this picture is up, let me just remind you, ignore those gray rectangles down there. They, nobody, you know, I was talking to this, one of the system administrators yesterday on email, and he doesn't know how to turn off those. Nobody seems to know how to destroy this unhelpful rectangle down there of stuff. I didn't ask them to tally up bonus points and percentages and stuff, but nobody can turn it off, so... Just ignore it. And I even have a, a little warning here, X, X, X. That's the, da that's the international danger symbol, X, X, X. All right, so try to follow that. Now, um, another student asked uh, in discussions about homework 12, uh, so let's talk about calculation items. Here was a discussion posting from a student, Cameron Rolfe. Um, trouble entering the numbers by the way when you have a numeric question you may have noticed this it'll add zeros to your answer until you have four uh, decimal places worth of 
numbers. You know, so, so I asked you to the nearest on this problem, homework 12, I asked you to calculate to the nearest tenth, I think, tenth of a meter, uh, and but it would add in some zeros after that. So it, that is not a problem, but there is a problem um, because if you look at this discussion, um, the student wasn't aware that every time you to do another attempt on the homework with one of these calculation type questions, it resets all the numbers to some random set of values. All right. So um, because of that, resetting it to a uh, random set of values, you can't recycle an answer. So in other words, if you got it correct on attempt number two, you can't, and you know, and you write it down, you know, yeah, I got this baby locked. That might not be a correct answer on attempt number three. You know, you might be SOL. And that's, and it's not because you're, a, you, you know, you don't know how to do number two. It's because you didn't read carefully on number three. So read carefully when you're doing these questions. Now, the multiple choice it is also similar. Sometimes I'll set it to kind of shuffle the A's, B's, C's, and D's. So always, always, always read. Matter of fact, put that at the top of your uh, notes uh, uh, of your study guide for every exam. Read carefully. and Because if you read too fast, you're going to be SOL. Uh, well, possibly. You're going to miss something. Okay. Um, I want to give you a couple tips about subscribing to my highlighter notes inside the textbook uh, in the bookshelf application. Now, Darianne uh, has taken off for the morning, but she and I have been uh, kind of experimenting with it. And if you go into your bookshelf application like this, and then if you, if you, you know, you can go into different, you know, here's different pages and stuff. Here's. Uh, one of the pages, um, you can add notes. You can add little, you know, sticky notes. So that's this little yellow thing over here on the right. Now, I can do that as well. Now, when I was preparing this morning for lecture, I added a whole bunch of sticky notes to my bookshelf. And you can read those if you subscribe to my notes. And I th I'm not sure where it is in your application. I think it might be in Friends. But this you, you subscribe by using this email address. Now, this is my phony baloney Knights email account. I don't use it for Jack, except when I want to you know, po put in a fake uh, email account for some software stuff. And that's what I've done here. So it's my last name completely misspelled, Brubeckner at knights.ucf.edu. But if you subscribe to that, you know, figure out how to do it in your, your preferences and bookshelf, uh, yeah, you can see all my notes. And that will be uh, mighty nice. You'll see my comments. And hopefully, if I get this thing rolling uh, well, uh, you'll, be able to, you'll be able to read ahead as I prepare the next lecture. All right, so right now, all the notes are about Tuesday's lecture. And nothing about today's lecture, but hopefully I'll be able to start posting notes ahead of time, and you guys will feel like geniuses um, walking into class if you've looked at my notes. Well, hopefully you'll feel like geniuses. All right, so Brubeckner at knights.ucf.edu. Uh, go ahead and do that. Now, last time um, we talked about the distance triangle, and uh, here's a slide from last time. I, I want to... Uh, go through a few examples with you to reinforce those. And you know what? For homework five, uh, homework five will uh, be ready for you by lunchtime tomorrow, if not sooner. Uh, homework five, I, I may put another couple drop distance or drop time. Ooh, you know what? I could put a drop time problem on there, uh, a brain burner, uh, as well as some new stuff. So let's uh, go and look. Here's homework number four, or homework four, problem number 12. And as I mentioned to you, the software will reset the
the numeric content, you know, all the, co all the calculations require that you have some kind of numbers to work with, all right? And 9.8 meters per second squared is the same for every free fall so problem. So it can't be 9.8 meters per second squared. In this case, this is the one number that changes each time. So you might have had 1.89 seconds of drop time on attempt number one, but on attempt number two, it might have been 1.16. All right, that's all right. You handle it the same way, and but you get a fresh thing to check. You know, if you had the same thing every time, you'd just be able to game the system. But this way, you can, you know, really know what you're doing. If, you know, by the time, by the fourth attempt, you you knock it down. So this one requires that you use the one half GT squared formula for the drop distance. Uh, the time is 1.89 square, not 1.9. Excuse me. The time is 1.89 seconds in this instance. So that is the number that goes in the formula uh, for t squared, or delta t, quantity squared. So 1.89 seconds quantity squared. Now, if you do that up on a calculator uh, over here, this is a, a little graphic of my built-in Mac uh, OS calculator. Uh, you get 3.5721, and then it's seconds squared. All right? And then you, you, you know, that's part of your calculation. Then you have to multiply it by one half G. Okay, now one half G is one half times 9.8. So that's, that's basically 4.9 meters per second per second. Or in compact notation, 4.9 meters per second squared. So, the, you know, so you take your previous answer and then just go multiply by 4.9. And you get 17.503 uh, two nine meters for the drop distance. And then usually inside web courses or on an eye clicker question, I'm going to tell you, okay, give me to the nearest meter or the nearest tenth of a meter. Uh, and the homework was nearest tenth of a meter, so you round it off to 17.5 in this particular case. All right. Now that was homework for item number 12. We're going to do another example of that, but let me pause uh, for a question. And I always pause 15 seconds. That's an old school teacher method. The 15 second rule. Whenever you ask for questions, always give the students 15 seconds and usually you'll get a question if there's one out there. All right, let's try another example uh, from the Minds of Moria. If you, rem if you saw that, that movie, The Fellowship of the Ring, with Pippin Took, Peregrine Took, he blew it. He dropped something down that well <laughs> in the Minds of Moria. So we're, we're going to try a little example of that. All right, so here's our example. And this is basically the same thing. You drop a rock down the well, and you hear the splash at 3.2 seconds. Now, it's not that deep, so we're going to assume that we're, we're not going to count the amount of time for sound waves to move back up to the top of the well. Okay, so 3.2 seconds is the drop time. All right, how deep is the well? All right, so let's figure it out. You use the uh, drop distance formula. Now, if you threw it down the well, you'd use a different formula. But if it's dropping, this is all you got to do. Question. Using the drop distance formula, that's the concept we're practicing. Okay? Because students get nervous about formulas and stuff. And, you know, you know which we, we, I want to get you guys working smooth, nothing but net. Question. The question was, is the drop distance always in meters? And the answer to that is yes. I'm always going to be working metric. And drop distance is meters. You know, if we were talking atoms or something, I might be doing nanometers. But 
you know, drop distances, yeah. So an apple out of a tree, meters is good. And I might ask an answer to the nearest hundredth of a meter, which is a centimeter, but you'll always it'll always be spelled out. We're not going to be doing inches. We're not going to be doing feet. We may talk about miles per hour, but we're always going to be calculating in meters per second metric. Okay, so here's the plug-in step. Um, here's one half, of course. That's the easy one. And then here's 9.8 meters per second squared. And here's 3.2 seconds quantity squared. Now notice that that squared symbol, that second power, is outside the brackets. Okay, so you have to go 3.2 squared, and you have to square the seconds as well. And that's this level. Okay, so here's a uh, good old 9.8 times 0 0.5. That's 4.9 meters per second squared. And then this one, uh, 3.2 quantity squared is 10.24. Uh, anybody verify me on that? 10.2, okay. Raise your, don't say, don't say anything, just raise your hand if, if I ask you to verify me. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, okay, and then, and notice that it says second squared here and that that's inside the square brackets. It doesn't matter what shape you use for the brackets. It matters how you use the brackets to, you know, so I could have used just the regular parentheses there. The S squared is now inside that group, inside the square brackets. And I didn't do it here on this slide, but you can mentally or with your pencil cross out S squared in the denominator here in the parentheses denominator and cross out second squared over here inside the top or it doesn't even have a denominator you know, the square brackets and the only thing that's not canceled out is a pair of numbers that are multiplied together and then the symbol M for meters which is good that's what we want we want a distance in meters and we cancel second squared. Everything is uh, lovely. Okay. And so you calculate it out and you get, you know, 50.176 meters uh, and then maybe you round it off to whatever I ask you to do. Anyways, that's that's your answer. Okay, and that's, that's actually pretty deep for a what? That's not deep for the mines of Moria, but it's pretty deep for a well here on Earth. Uh... By the way, uh, we're podcasting the podcasting in invisible quotation marks. Uh, we're podcasting each lecture in YouTube instead of iTunes U, which we used to use. That worked nicely, but now we're, it seems to be working fairly nicely in YouTube. And I am trying to figure out how to not only put up a transcript, we've got the transcript of our lectures. You may have noticed that on the podcast page in web courses, but I'm actually trying, I'm going to start trying to get captioning going accurately in YouTube using that transcript. Apparently there's a way to do that. All right, so hopefully that'll make things nice. Uh, for those of you that uh, want closed captioning, which is nice. You know, that's how I, I watch TV sometimes. You know, when I don't want to disturb my, my lovely wife. Where did I get 9.8 from? Who knows the answer to that? 9.8, that's just a random number, right? No. Where? Six, that's, that's gravity. That's the acceleration due to gravity. We're going to talk some more about that here in a minute when we get to Galileo. All right, it's it's 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, now I want to um, kind of wrap up some of these formulas, and what we're going to do is connect each of the formulas and a couple new formulas with this idea of distance polygons. You know, from the velocity versus time graph. And we had a distance rectangle and a distance triangle. And theoretically, you could do distance trapezoids and all different, you know, kind of figures. But those are the two, sim two simplest ones. Okay, drop distance. This one in 
encodes the distance for something that has initial velocity 0. So V subscript I, that's the initial velocity, is 0. In other words, you're holding your water balloon at the top of the, wa at the, top of the library, waiting for your friend to walk right underneath you and then let it go. Okay, so you're not throwing it downward. That would be me. Okay. All right, so that's 1 half gt squared. Now, here's the generic form of that for any, you know, accelerating. So this could be something accelerating from rest uh, could be horizontally, you know, and this will measure the distance. Okay, now those are the two simplest equations. Actually, this is the simplest one. Um, generic distance. Uh, X subscript F here means final position on the X axis. And X subscript I right here on the other side of the equal sign means initial position on the X axis. Okay, so if you want to know your final position on the X axis, you take your initial position and then you add a little bit more distance according to whether you have some speed or not. Okay, So there's your initial speed times your elapsed time. And uh, we use delta t um, frequently. And we're going to stop using delta t as much. Um, and try to streamline things with just the symbol t. So this is the position. Now this is unaccelerated. This is just you know, cruising along. Uh, this, so th really, this is cruising along on cruise control. Okay. So colloquial expression here, cruise control. You know, 55 miles an hour or 65 miles an hour. Or if you're a scaredy cat, 25 miles an hour. Okay, question. The cruise control is right here, VI. There's no additional change to your your state of motion, okay? So you start at position xi, and then you're at speed vi for an amount of time t, and that gives you your position. All right, now, I'm going to give you a deluxe formula for, a even more, for an even more generic um, situation and that is if you're moving along the x-axis and you have some speed to start but you're also accelerating if you have some acceleration well you just put together the one half at squared to this easy cinch equation this is the cinchiest of the three you know speed times time that's everybody knows that okay they teach that in fifth grade you know, I didn't learn that in fifth grade. Unbelievable. This my, my son, he's a junior in high school. He's learning more math than I ever thought about learning. Even some of that stuff he, I didn't learn until I was in college. It's amazing. Anyway, so this one, look at this. Final position on the x-axis. That's x subscript f. And just look. Okay, starting point on the x-axis x subscript i ivana okay and then here's my if you start with speed you still have that speed you're building on that and this encodes the fact that you're building on that initial speed all right so this is the acceleration term and notice that it goes up it's like a a polynomial remember those in 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 algebra 2 class factoring polynomials the reason that they love talking about algebra 2 teachers are always gasping about factoring it's because of equations like this this is a second degree polynomial in the variable t this is t to the second this is t to the first and if you will this very first term is t to the zeroth power anything to the zeroth power is equal to one and you can always multiply an invisible one next to anything. So x 
subscript i times 1 is x subscript i times t to the zeroth power. So this is a polynomial, the zeroth power of t, the first power of t, and the second power of t. All right. And let's extend it to the vertical state. So this is free fall. And actually, on this one, uh, you have to make a side note on this one. This one, you have to use negative 9.8 meters per second squared for G. Because this, and if you do, then this little equation will ac accommodate upward motion and downward motion. Okay? So if you have a pop-up with V, I, Y, initial speed in the Y direction, positive upward and g is negative this one will give you position even after it starts coming back down all right so if you're playing baseball at the edge of a cliff and you have a pop-up you're at the edge of the cliff and you have a pop-up that goes straight up and then it starts coming back down and then it goes goes past you and keeps going below you. At, you're at the edge of the cliff right here, you know, like Wile E. Coyote. And then the cliff drops off and the baseball goes down past you and below you on the cliff. That's negative Y values. That's all in, encoded in this, or it can be um, extracted from this equation. So this works great if you use minus signs for downward or for positions below your origin. Question. Yeah, gravity's going to be the, but if, if you throw something downward. All right, so here's another example. Instead of starting with some V, I, Y upward positive, what if you, you know, you know, you're Wile E. Coyote, you're trying to trick the roadrunner, right? Okay, so let's, you throw your, your you know, Wile E. Coyote's always got anvils or something he's trying to drop on the, on the roadrunner. So you throw it down. What if you throw it straight down at the roadrunner? Well, that would mean V I subscript V subscript I Y is negatory. You could have a negative sign there for somebody that throws it downward. All right, so you can you know do all kinds of tricky stuff. Now the 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 wily e. coyote theoretically he knows this stuff, but he always gets tricked. Anyway, now distance polygons. These terms with second order time t to the tooth power t to the second power those are distance triangles Th those, that part of the distance comes from a distance triangle of one kind or another All right, and we've taken a look at at those now the cinchy part is here the v times t part of each equation comes from the from a distance rectangle. All right, so the concepts that we talked about last time, the distance rectangle and the distance triangle, they're all encoded in these fancy equations. Now, most of the time, we're going to be using this one, but in actuality, we could think we could actually maybe use this one down here. Uh, I might give you a question with, with that last equation. You know, so that'd be like, you know, if you're a if you're a basketball referee and you're throwing the ball up to, you know, the the jump ball at the beginning of the game, you throw it straight up in the air. But what if you're like a Decepticon and you want to and you want to trick all the basketball players? You throw it straight downward. You know, you could you could you know use this. A negative number here, okay, if you wanted to. All right, now let me pause for questions here. Um, in the purple T-shirt. That stands for the y-axis, your vertical coordinate on, you know, because it's free fall, so you're somewhere, you know, you're, somewhere on the y-axis okay and x usually traditionally means this horizontal axis you know question back behind 
Yes. Uh, it, actually, that is correct. And that's true for all of them because they started with a little bit of push off. Okay, so, yeah. So, um, uh, let's see, who was it in this class? Uh, Jacob and uh, Javier. Uh, those guys, they had to have a little bit of push off to get started. Okay. So yeah, so theoretically that would that would be the the formula that we would use to track that whole system. Question over here. Initial. Okay, so remember when I was talking about initial conditions to predict and this encodes that that whole concept to predict some final some later time why at, at time you know, 2 seconds or whatever, some you know, final position, you need the initial conditions, the initial position, and the initial speed. Okay? And then, and then th this is the equation of motion. Okay? This, you know, knowing the initial speed and the initial position, and knowing this equation allows you to make your prediction. Okay? Question back over here somewhere. Yeah. You you know it, if you're if you have a start with a pop up, you know you're the regular referee and you throw the basketball upward. You still use negative nine point eight meters per second for because it's slowing down, and with every second, if you're on the way up, that minus sign means that you're losing speed for every second of upward motion. Okay, uh, but if you don't use the minus sign, you're going to be all blooped up. So. You, it's so it, it's it's tricky and and that and uh, you know maybe Thursday w or Tuesday next week we'll work out an example on that. Okay. All right. I want to uh, do a question with you um, that requires you to put some sentences together using a code. Now I'm going to put a table of codes. Uh, up on the screen and you're going to type in some letters to form a sentence you know like give me twenty dollars or whatever you want to type in from the code table but go to frequency BB and we're going to build a sentence together now it's just a practice question you're going to have to do this on exams and sometimes in class when I ask you a really really deluxe question now here's how to answer a question with letters and numbers and forming a code. When the question begins, you will have the letter A. And then you press the up and down arrow keys to change it from A to some other letter or number or symbol. You can actually, there's actually mathematical symbols, you know, like equal sign, plus sign and stuff. Um, then you press the right arrow key after you get the, the symbol that you want. And then you do the same thing for the next character. And you just keep repeating. Um, and you can edit your answer by moving the left arrow back and forth and changing it. And then when, you're comp when you have everything the way you want it, you hit the send button. And you'll get the check mark. Now on these kind of questions, this is alphanumeric. This is the fanciest of all the questions that we can ask. Um, the alphanumeric questions, the system is waiting for you. It doesn't know when you've typed in your whole sentence in code. So um, you have to signify that to my computer by hitting the send button. All right, so here we go. Let's try it. And it's, it's not a Chuck Norris question, but it's, uh, it's kind of a generic question <laughs> um, okay let's see okay so you should you should get the letter A raise your hand if you've got letter A good now everybody hush you hear that sound shh quiet 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 everybody 
You hear that? People are clicking stuff in. Sounds like static, crackling static electricity. All right, keep going. Type in your sentences about Brittany or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Let me see it. Oh, you're not on the right frequency. BB, come on. Hello? My cell phone went off. Okay, so don't steal my, my patented sentence. J-O-M-R-Q. If you do, I'll know who it is. And then you, you could write your, your uh, symbols down or write your sentence down. And we'll take a look at them. Have you got it now? Yo. Do you have it now? Okay. Leave Brittany alone. Shark tornadoes. Okay, 30 seconds. And I think the, the, the maximum number of symbols you can type is 14, if I'm not mistaken. So you can't write a sonnet or a, a novel or anything, but you can write it. Now, I'm going to be asking you questions about physics using this method, you know, like about waves or momentum or something like that. So this is just a practice question for today. So hopefully you, you, everybody's going to get points for this. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. By the way, I, I synchronized the roster before class. And there's only about 30 students now uh, in, uh, I think it's 37 or 36 that are not registered. So that's good. And we have 307, 307 students answering this question. All right, let me stop it. And, well, apparently a lot of you want to leave Brittany alone, X, Y, Z. Uh, AGF, French fries are enjoyable. Nice. JNA, I consume French fries. J O N A, I always consume french fries a g o f let's look at this one a g o f french fries are always enjoyable see how you can you can express your your, your relationship to french fries in, in you know a bunch of different ways now here's the cool part of this or, or Cheetos, if you have a thing about Cheetos, you know, whatever happens. Here's, here's the cool part about it. And this is what I love about this kind of question. You can express a physics concept that is A, correct, no, A, comprehensible, and B, correct in a lot of different ways. And because I'm a human, not a machine, 
I can understand them. And I can go through, you know, those codes and say, yeah, they, they understand French fries. Or I can go through your codes and say, yeah, they understand waves. They get an A. Or, yeah, they understand chemical reactions. They get an A. All right? So that is a very nice benefit to this kind of a task. All right, and let's go down the list here. John, what? <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> I don't know, you guys. Yotaz. Let's see what this means. Brittany. Always finds French fries alone. <laughs> X J U A. Leave me <laughs> with. <laughs> See, we got a whole, and and so we're just goofing around with French fries and shark tornadoes and stuff. But as I mentioned. On a serious note, we'll be using this for you to express an idea that it's kind of like, you know, me asking you a question individually and you putting together a question like nobody else can and it can still be true and righteous. And I'll be able to see that and, yep, that makes sense. Sharknados. Who? Wait a minute. What's shark? Sharknadoes is RS. I don't see any RSs here. Oh, Sharknado at the top? That's the name of the question. I always name each question. This is the Sharknado question. J H M A. I swim with. French fries. Uh, hmm. Maybe that's a little too much information. I'm not really sure I want to know too much about that little concept. But anyway, so so we're we're kind of goofing around with this, but we'll be doing serious physics questions, and they're really nice. And you know the thing about it, if you think about it, on this kind of a question. It's so much different than a calculation. It's so much different from a multiple choice. The calculation, you've got to come to one number and only one number. And I am the one that decides that, basically, when I write the question. Multiple choice, you've got to settle on one letter, A, B, C, D, or E, and only one, and I'm the one that controls that. But in this one... You have control and you can be creative, you know, about how you express it. And I love that. I love giving you guys that freedom because that's the way things ought to be. At least that's the way I look at it. All right. Let's get into chapter two of the textbook, which is about a very famous confrontation between these two cats, Aristotle and his mini-me, no, I shouldn't say that, his BFF, Galileo. Galileo, you know, everybody always thinks, uh, Aristotle, he was an idiot. But actually, Aristotle was pretty smart, and the thing, a couple things held him back. First of all, he did not have advanced mathematics to the level that Galileo and then Newton Newton invented calculus. Okay, so, and, and uh, the, the guys in the days of Aristotle and Plato, they had pretty good geometry and stuff, but th they needed a little bit more. Also, they didn't have really good equipment for observing things. Like, they nobody had, inv they hadn't invented the telescope until the, the time of Galileo. So Galileo was the one that first observed uh, the surface of the moon. The fact that 
you know, with a telescope, the fact that the moon's surface is not perfectly smooth. It's filled with mountains and valleys, shadows, bright areas, craters and stuff. Uh, nobody knew that until Galileo turned the telescope uh, toward the moon and started observing stuff. So uh, Aristotle, you know, he did all right. But by the time Galileo came up, everybody else in academia, you know, they, they'd have, they, you know, the University of Padua, University of Naples, Oxford, and came, they were really, they were already centuries old by the time Galileo rose. He was a math professor in Padua in Italy ancient universities and in academia Aristotle was very influential and all the other people in academia were mini-me uh, for uh, Aristotle in other words they, whatever Aristotle says that's what I say except for Galileo he said you know look if you're looking at this great book of the universe that everybody can read and if you're extracting some mathematical truth to it, you know, like one-half GT squared, um, then that has authority over what anybody might say. So, you, so Galileo was, he liked Aristotle, he, he, and he had studied Aristotle, Aristotle's physics and his metaphysics, but he was willing to go past that and take his guidance from the great book of creation and make mathematical statements about it and that's chapter two in your textbook is all about his master stroke and that was about states of motion distinguishing states of motion that aristotle did not think of so let's talk, talk about that and one of the things that aristotle talked about was uniform motion and everybody was, you know, you know, going along at a certain speed, constant direction. You know, so many meters per second, uh, always the same number of meters per second in a given direction. Um, you know, okay, that's good. Aristotle had a had a good idea on that. Everybody, you know, that's a fairly simple concept. You know, the whole idea of a velocity. Um, and you know, you you. You calculate a velocity using uh, time and distance measurements. Aristotle also understood, or he didn't understand as well as Galileo did, but he thought a lot about things speeding up and slowing down and how things were caused to slow up and, and to speed up and to slow down. Uh, and what Galileo figured out was something uh, in between those two states of motion. Now, I'm going to, I'm pushing a big, gigantic blob of text at you here. Let me just read it for you. You don't have to copy this down. Let me just read it for you. The properties belonging to uniform motion have been discussed in the preceding section, but accelerated motion remains to be considered. Okay, nice. I was just told, and this is a quote from from one of Galileo's books. The first of all, and first of all, it seems desirable to find an explanation to find and explain a definition best fitting natural phenomena. So go ahead and write that sentence down. Best explanation, best fitting natural phenomena. For anyone may invent an arbitrary type of motion and discuss its properties. Thus, for instance, some have imagined helices and conchoids as described by certain motions which are not meant within nature and have very commendably established the properties which these curves possess in virtue of their definitions. But we, this is Galileo saying, we have decided to consider the phenomena of bodies falling with an acceleration such as actually occurs in nature. Not some kind of made up helice, helix, a spiral. 
something that actually occurs in nature. And to make this definition of accelerated motion, exhibit the essential features of observed accelerated motion. So this is his prototype. Free fall was Galileo's prototype of all accelerated motions. And by God, he was on the money. And he is still on the money, you know, 400 years later. So it's amazing when you think about it. And this, at last, after repeated efforts, we trust we have succeeded in doing. In this belief, we are confirmed mainly by the consideration that experimental results are seen to agree with this. Experimental results that agree with his concept. Go ahead and jot that down. There's your pull quote. You know, he wasn't, he, you know, this is Galileo taking a lesson and keeping notes. He's taking his lesson from the great book of nature itself, whose language is written in a mathematical form. You know, you, you wonder about it. You know, what if, what if nature was not mathematical? What could it be? You know, what if nature was musical? That would be kind of cool. You know, the laws of nature were expressed in music. That'd be kind of cool. So, experimental results are seen to agree with and exactly correspond with those properties which have been, one after another, de demonstrated by us. Finally, in the investigation of naturally accelerated motion, we were led by hand, as it were, in following the habit and custom of nature herself, in all her various other processes, to employ only those means which are most common, simple, and easy. Go ahead and jot that one down as well. Only those means which are most common, simple, and easy. And that, my wonderful students, is something that he shared with Aristotle and all the great thinkers. Everybody's always convinced that whatever nature is doing, it's probably a fairly simple thing. If you can see it and savvy it, the simpler thing is probably going to be true instead of the more complicated thing. All right? So here are some of these pull quotes. And we, um, and so you can jot these down. And first of all, it seems desirable to find and explain a definition best fitting natural phenomena from the great book of nature. Second pull quote, we have decided to consider the phenomena of bodies falling with an acceleration such as actually occurs in nature and to make this definition of accelerated motion exhibit the essential features of observed accelerated motions. Okay, so he's, he's saying, this is him making a conjecture. My guess, he's saying, is that nature, the prototype acceleration in nature can be seen every day in free fall. And if we, so if we study free fall and get a lock on that, we'll have a good handle on any other acceleration, you know, that we see in nature. Whether it's a Ferrari accelerating from 0 to 60 on the turnpike, or a ship tossing back and forth in the ocean, or a satellite like the moon. Now, Isaac Newton's the one that figured out the moon. Galileo did, didn't figure that acceleration out, but, you know, he might have if he would thought about it for a little bit longer. Third pull quote, we are confirmed mainly by the consideration that experimental results are seen to agree with the book of nature and with his, his concepts. Now, you can go back and, and, uh, and, and actually read that in Galileo. Here's another thing that he wrote. Here's a, an image, his famous, you know, leaning tower of Pisa experiment. You know, supposedly he dropped a, um, a cannonball and a, um, a smaller lead sphere uh, from the top of the leaning tower. And they both fell to the ground and hit at the same instant. And that contradicted what Aristotle had predicted. And Aristotle and his disciples had felt that the heavier something was, the cannonball, for instance, the faster it would fall. But Galileo said, no, I could prove that. Supposedly, nobody knows if he actually did this or did something instead that was was like this. But here's here's kind of what what he found. Um, if we now examine the matter carefully, we find no addition or increment more simple than that which repeats itself always in the same manner. 
Okay, now what does that mean? Well, it means that I'll drop it from rest and start my stopwatch, and then I'll record the speed. Now, after one second, if he'd been working in the metric system, this is what he would have seen. 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. After the second second, 19.6. After the third second, 29.4. After the fourth second, it's really whipping. That's about 80 miles an hour. 39.2 meters per second, etc., etc. And direction is downward. So if you're struggling, I want you to recall, re remember this, that the acceleration expresses this idea that the addition or subtraction of speed always repeats itself in the same manner, right? If you're on the way down, you're always gaining 9.8 for every second of free fall. Now, if you were on the way up, you'd be subtracting it, subtracting 9.8, subtract another 9.8, subtract another 9.8 for every second you're on the way up, okay? So the increase, if you're on the way down, the increase repeats itself. Always another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. And so that, my wonderful students, is why we express the fact that it's 9.8 meters per second squared for the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth. Question. The fact that you're always adding speed at the same rate, so the, a certain increase of speed for every second of acceleration, or if you're slowing down, a certain decrease repeats itself for every uh, second of slowing down. Now, on Tuesday next week, I want you to read over the weekend chapter 2 and start reading headed to chapter 3. Homework 5 will be ready by lunchtime tomorrow, uh, if not sooner. Uh, and that should be and that will be due on Tuesday. Okay, you're dismissed. A few minutes early today.